To figure out what's going on, let's define a very, very specific way that we'll use to measure time, or for a particular reference frame to measure time. Let's imagine that we've got an astronaut in a rocket, and this astronaut has a clock, and the clock works like this. There's a little photo emitter, in other words, it emits a little beam of light. That beam of light goes up to a mirror, and then reflects back down to a photo detector and the distance between the emitter and the mirror is some distance, we'll call it capital D. So the clock kind of works like this. It emits light, tick, it reflects back, is received, talk. So tick, talk, tick, talk, tick, talk, something like that, okay? Let's say that the time that it takes between the emission and the reception is some amount of time we'll call delta t sub o, or delta t naught. Now, why exactly we'll call that delta t naught, I'll come back to later on. But, just for the sake of argument for right now, let's imagine that the astronaut then has some time delta t naught between the emission and the reception. So the astronaut measures some time between these two events. Now this is very important. The astronaut measures the time between the events of emission and reception as delta t naught. Delta t naught is the time between two events, the events being the emission and the reception of that light. Okay? Great. Now, let's imagine that this rocket is moving relative to another reference frame. Now, which one is really moving and which one is really stationary? Remember, we can't say that. This astronaut is stationary with respect to the rocket's reference frame. Another frame is moving relative to that, to the rocket. Let's call it the Earth. The Earth thinks the Earth is stationary and the rocket is moving. The rocket thinks the rocket is stationary and the Earth is moving. All we can do is say that there's another reference frame that is moving relative to the rocket. So here we have an observer on the Earth. So an observer on the Earth's reference frame. And here's the rocket that is moving by relative to the Earth. So here are the events. Let's, let's look at the events that, uh, of the clock ticking. So the emission of light from the emitter, then the, emi the emission goes towards the mirror, but the rocket is moving this way relative to the observer on the Earth, so the light actually has to travel this diagonal path to get up to the mirror. It reflects off the mirror and then follows this diagonal path down to this, the receiver when it's over here. So the two events that we're now talking about, the emission of the light occurs over here, the reception of the light occurs over here. Remember, the rocket is moving relative to the Earth, okay? So we've got these very different perspectives, the perspective of the astronaut in the rocket and the perspective of the person on the Earth. Now let's say that the time between these two events, the emission, and the reception, measured by the observer on the Earth, we'll call that delta t. Now, isn't that just going to be delta t naught, the same as the time measured by the astronaut? Well, let's see. We'll figure that out. But, just for the sake of argument, we'll say that the time between those two events is delta t. Now, I've got to be a little bit careful with this, with this image here. How does this person measure that time interval? Well, this person cannot have one clock here. To do that, this person would have to have one clock over here at this event and another clock over here at this event to measure the time interval between those two events. And obviously, this person would have to have both of those clocks running synchronously. In other words, when this one read 12 o'clock, this one would read 12 o'clock. When this read 1 o'clock, this one would read 1 o'clock. So, this person, to measure the time interval, between these two events would need two clocks, one at this event and one at this event, to measure that time interval. And that person would obviously have to have those two clocks running, uh, uh, being synchronized. All right, the very important point. That time interval then measured by this person on the Earth we'll call delta t. Now why doesn't the astronaut need two clocks? Because the clock at the events uh, this uh, astronaut only needs one clock because that clock is moving along with those events and are at both events 
by definition, because that's, that clock is moving along with the, um, uh, with the rocket. Well, why can't this observer just have one clock and have it measure uh, the time of the event over here and then move along with the rocket and measure the time of the event over here? Well, if the observer on the Earth did that, then that observer would be in the reference frame of the rocket. Having a clock here that moves along with the rocket, that clock would be stationary with respect to the rocket and would therefore be in the reference frame of the rocket rather than being in the reference frame of the person on the Earth. So, the person on the Earth wants to measure the time interval between those events with clocks that are in her reference frame. In other words, stationary with respect to the Earth. So, the person on the Earth has to have two clocks. One here and one over there. Great. Now, what is the relationship between these measurements that the person on the rocket makes and the person on the Earth makes? Well, let's see. So let's look at what happens in the frame of the rocket ship first. We have light going from the emitter up to the mirror, traveling a distance d. Then, from the uh, mirror, back down to the receiver, traveling another distance, d. So, the total distance traveled by the light in the frame of the rocket is 2d. Now, with distance equals speed times time, we have 2d is equal to the speed, well, it's light, so that is c, times the time. Now remember, the time measured by the person in the rocket was the delta t naught. So c times delta t naught. Okay, there we go. That is the distance traveled by the light at speed c for a time delta t naught. Let me write that up here and we'll keep that handy. 2d equals c times delta t naught. Great. Now, what does this look like in the frame of the Earth? Now, what does this look like in the frame of the Earth? Well, here we've got the light being emitted by the first emitter going up to the mirror, but the rocket is moving relative to the Earth, so the light is actually going to travel a distance that looks like this up to the mirror. It strikes the mirror, then starts coming back down to the receiver, but again the rocket continues to move, and so now the light comes back down there. Let's say that this distance is some distance s. Likewise, this would be the same distance s. And what is the relationship between this and the time measured by the person on the Earth? Remember, we said that the time between these two events is delta t. So what we have, the distance traveled, is 2s. The speed, again, it's light that's traveling, so the speed is c. And the time between the two events is then delta t. There we go. So we have that 2s equals c delta t. Now, what about the motion of the rocket? Well, let's say that the rocket travels a distance l. So from here to here, let's say that this is some distance l. And then, likewise, another distance L for the second event. Now, the rocket is traveling, let's say, at some speed V. So the rocket is traveling at some velocity V. In the Earth's reference frame, we have the rocket traveling a distance of 2L at a speed of V for a time delta T. So we've got these three relationships, 2s equals c delta t naught, 2d equals c delta t naught, 2s equals c delta t, and 2l equals v delta t. Now let's divide both sides of all of these by 2, and what do we have? We have that d equals 1 half delta t naught, we have that s equals one-half c delta t, and we have that l equals one-half v delta t. But here we've got a right triangle. We need to assume that the direction that this light is traveling 
is perpendicular to the velocity. It's very, very important. We are going to assume that this clock is arranged so that the light for the um, astronaut is moving perpendicular to the direction of the velocity relative to the Earth, so that we have this right triangle. Well, what do we know? We know then that s squared must equal d squared plus l squared. Well, let's put our values in for d, s, and l, and what do we get? Well, s is 1 half c delta t squared equals d 1 half c delta t naught squared plus l, which is 1 half v delta t squared. And let's multiply that all out and manipulate things around a little bit and see what we get. So, starting up here, what we ended up with last time, 1 half c delta t squared equals 1 half c delta t naught squared plus 1 half c delta t squared. Let's square the whole thing. What do we get? A half squared is 1 fourth c squared delta t squared equals 1 fourth c squared delta t naught squared plus 1 fourth v squared delta t squared. Let's multiply both sides by 4. That gets rid of all of the factors of 1 fourth. Let's bring the v squared delta t squared over here. That'll leave us with c squared minus v squared delta t squared equals c squared delta t naught squared. Let's divide both sides by c squared. So we'll divide both sides by c squared. We have c squared over c squared, which is 1, minus v squared over c squared, times delta t squared equals delta t naught squared. Let's divide both sides by 1 minus v squared over c squared. We'll have delta t squared equals 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared, delta t naught squared. And let's take the square root of both sides. And what do we have? Delta t equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared times delta t naught. And there we go. Well, is delta t the same as delta t naught? It is not. It has a difference of this factor of 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now, that combination of things, 1 over root 1 minus v squared, v squared over c squared, that is something that we are going to see so often that it has its own symbol. The square root of 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared, that is called gamma. That is a lowercase Greek letter gamma. Uh, now, we can actually simplify this in a slightly different way. We can write this uh, slightly differently. This ratio of V over C, that tells us how fast is the rocket going relative to the speed of light. So if V were 1.5 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, V over C would be 1.5 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, or 0.5. That tells us that the rocket is moving at 0.5 times the speed of light, or half the speed of light. If V were, say, uh, 1 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, then V over C would be 1 third, or 0.333. That's telling us that the rocket is moving at a third the speed of light. So V over C basically tells us the speed of the rocket in terms of the speed of light. That's a quantity that we're going to see often enough that it's got its own symbol, and that is called beta. This is a lowercase Greek letter beta. And we could just think of that as the speed of the rocket in this case, relative to the speed of light. Is it 0.5 if it's going half the speed of light? Is it 0.9 if it's going 90% of the speed of light? Uh, it would be 0.99 if the rocket were going at 99% of the speed of light. Okay? Like that. We could then write gamma as the square root of 1 over 1 minus beta squared. So it's just a slightly simpler form of writing beta. We can think of beta as the speed relative to the speed of light, and then gamma, which is sometimes referred to as the, relativity, the relativistic factor, as root 1 over 1 minus beta squared.
Excellent. Now, if delta t is not the same as delta t naught, why don't we notice this kind of thing? Why don't we notice it that when someone is moving relative to someone else, if, for example, someone gets on a train and goes for a train ride and come back, why, doesn't, why don't we notice that the time that passes for one person is not the same as the time that passes for another person? If this factor is there, why don't we notice this sort of thing? Why didn't Isaac Newton notice this sort of thing? Well, let's stick some numbers in here and we'll see why. Let's imagine that our rocket is moving at 1.50 times 10 to the 8 meters per second relative to the Earth. So what's beta in that case? Well, beta, remember, is V over C, so that would be 1.50 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by C, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Divide that out and we get 0 0.500. That's beta, so what's gamma? Gamma is 1 over root 1 minus beta squared, or 1 over root 1 minus 0.5 squared, which gives us 1.15. That's gamma. Now, if delta t naught, in other words, the time measured by the person in the rocket in this case, is one second, if delta t naught is one second, delta t, which is gamma times delta t naught, would be 1.15 seconds. Now that is a big difference, one second and 1.15 seconds. That means that for every second in the rocket, the person on the Earth would think that 1.15 seconds have passed by. The person on the Earth would think that the person in the rocket was experiencing time more slowly, or everything in the rocket would appear to be going more slowly for the person on the Earth. Let's imagine that the person in the rocket, whose clock is ticking every second, according to the person in the rocket, is walking and is walking one step every second. Well, the person on the Earth would think that the person in the rocket was walking with one step every 1.15 seconds, or more slowly. If the person's heart in the rocket were beating once every second, the person on the ground would think on the earth that the, would think that the person's heart was beating more slowly. So the person on the earth would think that everything was moving in time more slowly for the person in the rocket than the person on the earth. This definitely seems like something that we would have noticed before the early 1900s if there's this big difference. Well, the reason is that this speed that we had to put in here, the 1.5 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, is an incredibly fast speed. It is half the speed of light. It is much faster than anything that your ordinary, everyday person is going to be moving, at which they'd be moving. Let's put in a more ordinary speed and see what kind of result we get in that case. Let's imagine now we have a much more normal, everyday sort of situation. Let's imagine our person, rather than being in a rocket traveling at half the speed of light, is actually just walking by at, let's say, a speed of one meter per second. In that case, beta, which is V over C, will be one meter per second divided by three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, or 3.33 times 10 to the minus ninth. And actually, let me just point out here, beta is going to be unitless because the units of V will cancel out the units of C. So beta is a unitless quantity, and therefore gamma is also unitless. So there's beta, 3.33 times 10 to the minus 9. Very, very small number. Now, to figure out gamma, gamma is 1 over root 1 minus beta squared, 1 over root 1 minus 3.33 times 10 to the minus 9 squared. Well, just notice, 3 times 10 to the minus 9 squared, that's going to be an extremely small number. Subtract that from 1, that's going to be very, very close to 1, just a tiny bit below. The square root, 1 over that, what we end up with is basically 1, but 5.56 times 10 to the minus 18th larger than 1. In other words, if we were going to write this out, it would be 1 1.01234567891213141415161617. And then, uh, let's see, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 17, and then 5, 5, 6, I think, something like that. I might have missed a zero. But basically a number that is extremely close to 1.
if delta t naught were one second, delta t would be this times one second. In other words, one second plus 5.56 times 10 to the minus 18 seconds. Now, is that difference anything that we would ever notice? Absolutely not. That's why for any ordinary everyday sort of motions that we deal with, even if we're talking about uh, motions in a, in a jet plane or something like that, the only way we could ever notice any kind of difference would be with an extremely accurate timepiece, like one of the atomic clocks that are used um, uh, to set uh, the time standards. So, this is not anything that we would notice under any ordinary everyday circumstances. Uh, now, one point about this delta t naught and delta t. Delta t naught, that was the time measured by the person in the rocket. In other words, the person that carries a single clock. In other words, the person that had one clock at the two different events. The emission of the light, the reception of the light. One clock at both events. When a single clock is used to measure the time between two events, as, as long as that one clock is at the location of the two events, that time we refer to as the proper time. So, the proper time is always measured by one clock. The other time, delta t, that was the time measured by the person on the Earth. And that had to be done with two clocks. So, whenever the time is measured between two events that is occurring at different places, in other words, you need two clocks to measure the time interval, that time we call the dilated time. And this result, that delta t is equal to gamma delta t naught, we call that equation the time dilation. The time dilation equation. Think about to dilate. If you go to the eye doctors and get your pupils dilated, that means that your pupils are larger. So, time dilation means that the time appears to be longer for this uh, frame that uses the two clocks as opposed to the frame that uses the one clock. Now, be careful. Just because we think, oh, this person is moving and this person is stationary, this one must be measuring the proper time, this must be measuring the, uh, the dilated time, well, be very careful. If this person measures a time interval with one clock, then this person would have to measure that time interval with two clocks. Therefore, the person on the Earth would measure the proper time, and the person up here would measure the dilated time. So remember, the way you tell the difference is, who is measuring the time interval with one clock? Who is measuring the time interval with two clocks? We can't say, this person's moving, this person's stationary, because that is completely dependent on the uh, frame of reference. Excellent. Now, one more thing. So we saw that with ordinary everyday type motions, it's very, very difficult to see the results of special relativity being anything different than ordinary Newtonian uh, physics. Well, uh, if you're interested, I would like to draw your attention to a really, really great book. It's called Was Einstein Right? And it's by Clifford Will. And it's all about experimental verifications of Einstein's theories. Not only special relativity, but general relativity that we'll talk a little bit about next time um, at the very end, when we, uh, when we have a little bit of time. So, uh, if you're interested, please take a look at that. Was Einstein Right? by Clifford Will. And that's all the time we have for today. I'll see you next time.